Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Dan Connolly. Um, Madmo.com is my tinkering lab notebook, also known as my blog. Uh, I'm going to do a little intro in case we have, I end up using this later. Um, What's mad mode? My day job is writing software to support research at KU Medical Center in the informatics division, though I'm best known for my work on HTML and web architecture at W3C. I'm a family man, which gives me perspective on the Kansas City area, America, and the world we live in. Between all that, I like to tinker. The bane of my existence is doing things that I know the com computer could do for me. Have you ever had one of those ideas that wouldn't let go, not even to eat or to sleep? Uh, my mom said the first time she saw me like that was after they gave me Tinker Toys for my third or fourth Christmas. She said I was in mad scientist mode, just like my chemistry professor father. Um, so these are all the tags in my blog, and one of them is capabilities. Um, so I've got, I've blogged about capabilities a lot of times. Um, I'm kind of going to start here, my 2017 wish list. Um, the first line is actually Mark Miller's. Computers are getting smaller, uh, faster, smaller, more connected, and more capable. But when it comes to security, everything is broken. Has anybody read this this essay by Quinn Norton? No. Um, oh yeah. No, sure. The number of people whose job it is to make software secure can basically fit in a large bar, and I've watched them drink. It's not comforting. It's not a matter of when you'll get owned, it's only a matter of when. I'm not quite that pessimistic. Um, along with correct by construction software, for example, certified programming with dependent types, great book. Uh, the best weapon I see is object capability discipline. Um, and this is some stuff for, that was on my wish list at the time. Some of it's actually happened. Um, but before I got into that, I wanted to point out the, this list I managed, which is um, capability security technology that's ready to use today, including everything from SEL4, which L4, L4 is a family of operating systems. So SEL4 is a security version of it. Um, it's an open source operating system kernel with an end-to-end -end proof of implementation correctness and security enforcement. Um, so it's, it has both uh, correct, it's both correct by construction and it uses capabilities. So it's like peanut butter and chocolate. Um, it's really cool. Um, and then there's Sandstorm, a self-hostable software as a service platform, stuff like that. So um, this is my awesome object capabilities and capability-based security stuff. There's applications and services like Sandstorm, and there's libraries and frameworks, programming languages, operating systems. There's even capability-based CPUs. And then there's presentations, slots, and slides, um, and some articles and peer-reviewed stuff. Um, so Agoric is the folks that, that started a lot of this stuff. Um, Right, okay, so Agoric, and then I went to their technology. They have this really cool thing called ERTP that I wanna get going on R-Chain. Um, and, oh. Um, so this is the ERTP page and it has the link to their ERP talks and it's actually this um, talk series. And now I'm gonna use this really cool thing called tab copy and I'm gonna copy all those and Blammo. Oh, crud. I was in the wrong mode. Sorry. Uh, copy all those. Compact. Uh, edit. Blammo. Okay, so now everybody has that. Um, um, I guess I will do a little bit more. Uh, da, 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 where are the slides? Uh, okay, so um, all this stuff I'm going to talk about with object capabilities applies in JavaScript and Rolang. 
Um, that's also a point made. This repository, the wiki in this repository uh, is a pattern language for um, capabilities that for both JavaScript and Rolling. Um, just going to flip through this real quick. I think some of you have seen this. I was working on a, a Roland contract and slogging through it, adding print statements on every four, and it was a real pain. Um, and the Agoric folks um, have, they're not reinventing as much of the world. They're using somebody else's technology for stuff like explorers and stuff. They're using Cosmos. Um, but if we look at the, the if we compare the, the architectures, so um, the Agoric folks are, are right doing um, smart contracts with JavaScript. Our chain is doing smart contracts with Rolang. The JavaScript side, we've got capability side, security. On the Rolang side, we've got capability security. On the JavaScript side, we've got mints and purses. On the Rolang side, we've got mints and purses, although the purses are hard to get to. I owe you an issue on that. Um, and then, then the layers above mints and purses, they've got ERTP. We don't have that running on Rolang yet. I'm hoping we do soon. We have the vault thing. Uh, we have a proof of stake um, that use mints and purses and stuff like that. They don't have, they, they're just using Cosmos for their proof of stake. They're, they have not made it into a smart contract. They're thinking about that. They have a thing that's really cool, cool called Zoe for offer safety, but I won't get into that now. Um, uh, and turns out uh, Greg and company wrote a paper called Policy as Types. Uh, that's not the whole title, I can't remember. Anyway, but in section three of that, they, here's the Mint, the Make Mint con example, uh, and they actually sketch translating this to Rolang. Um, and so I actually went back and took my staking pool contract and sort of converted it back the other way back to, to um, JavaScript by hand. Um, and then I did some, some work. I picked up work on, that I had started in April 2018 to convert JavaScript to Rolang. Um, and out comes stakingpool.rolang. Um, so this is the hello world in both languages. Um, in Rolang, I can't remember why inserting in the registry was here. Um, Oh, right. So there's some stuff that's kind of, of R chain specific, and I've sort of made up stuff on the JavaScript side. Um, and then the stuff about proxies and stuff, I'm going to skip that for a minute. But in, in some ways, the hello world of, of cryptocurrency is check my balance. Um, and this is the check balance Rolang stuff that the core team publishes. Um, so I converted that back to JavaScript. And then, oh, and then, oh, darn, I didn't show the, the, the result. But the result is, is like this, except it's got um, sort of computer made up names in some places. Um, so for, for folks that, want, that, that know JavaScript and, and want to learn Rolang, we can, we can use these tools more. Um, so J JavaScript dev tools are more mature. Um, and like I've said, there's a bunch of these really tasty um, ERTP contracts. Has anybody heard of, of Uniswap? Sure thing. And yeah, so it's done, it's crossed the, it, it, it does more volume than um, Coinbase. Coinbase, right. So Autoswap is, is Uniswap written in JavaScript. So, you know, with, with a very straightforward amount of effort, we can convert that to Rolang. Um, yeah, 70 automatic port. Um, we could even add JavaScript support in our node. I've actually, the, the JS2 Rolang is written in Scala with the idea that we might actually stick it in our node and run JavaScript contracts on our chain at runtime. Um, and we might do cross chain interop via Cosmos and IB, uh, IBC. So that's kind of what motivates me to look at both these technologies side by side. Um, Okay, so Mark Miller is the CTO of Agoric, and he kind of pioneered, he and one other guy uh, wrote the original paper that, that had the word smart contract in it 30 years ago. Um, he did a, bunch, did a bunch of pioneering work. Uh, and so he has explained this stuff to a lot of people. <laughs> uh, 
and we're going to take advantage of that. Um, so they have this talk series. There's about there's a bunch of talks that explain their whole platform. But the part of their platform that's most relevant today is this object capability programming. Um, so this thing is 28 minutes, but I'm but he he talks slowly, and I'm going to play it fast. Um, but I think that most of that was for the benefit of people that might watch this recording some other time. I think most folks here know what I just talked about, but I will pause for questions here. Hearing none. Yeah, I just, um, uh, I heard you were saying about the means and the process. So is this some kind of standard terminology in, in, the, in some area? Mint and purse, or, or this is just how 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 we call the storage for for tokens. It comes from a paper in 2010, uh, 2000. Um, no, not that one. Sorry. Uh, this one, um, financial cryptography, two thousand. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Blah 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 blah. So, this is the original thing that introduced mints and, and, and purses. And it was written in E at the time. Um, but, you know, as I saw, it, it's, it's pretty well known in the, in the literature. So Greg's paper referred to it. And um, we have literally a, a contract called make mint.row in Rolang. So, I mean, it's not a piece of theory. It's a piece of code that runs, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is what I was asking. Right. All right. More questions? Well, I'm hoping that we go over some side-by-side -side, uh, examples at some point. So we can see see how the, how the JavaScript actually uh, corresponds to the uh, row line. Yeah, um, let's do the sh the short version of this video first. But that's a good point. Hold on to that one, okay, Jim? Don't don't let me forget. Oh, the other thing is time check. I'm planning 90 minutes here, starting uh, 15 minutes ago. Okay. Um, and I'm going to play this at uh, 1.5, I think. And I may just skip ahead in a few places if it's all blathering on about Agoric. I don't think it's going to do that very much. So how do we use JavaScript as a secure object capability language? And what are these object capabilities anyway? For this part of the talk, we're focusing on that letter. So if you thought that JavaScript cannot be used to write reliable or secure programs, I want to show you this counterexample. Throughout the talk, I'm only going to be making use of two main abstraction mechanisms in JavaScript, uh, the function and the record. Over here, we have a function called make counter on the outside. And every time it's called, it creates a new record with an inker and decker method and a new count variable, which is effectively the instance variable of this object. The inker and decker are shown on the surface because they're visible outside the object. The count variable is shown inside because it's encapsulated. Only the inker and decker method can get to it. Every time we call make counter, we get a distinct instance, and each of these instances is isolated from the others. What can we do with this? Well, for example, maybe we want to keep track of the number of people uh, inside a room by having an entry guard count up when people are entering the room, and an exit guard count down when people exit the room. So we can give the entry guard access to the inner function and the exit guard access to the decker function. And the result is that the entry guard can only count up the exit guard can only count down. So this gets at the core idea of object capabilities, which is a conventional object reference, familiar from object programming, is a permission. If object Bob does not have a reference to object Carol, then Bob cannot invoke Carol, cannot provoke whatever behavior Carol would have. If Alice has a reference to Bob, and Alice invokes Bob, passing Carol as an argument, then Alice has both used her permission to invoke Bob and given Bob permission to invoke Carol. So this is all familiar from memory safe object languages. What brings us to object capabilities is when this is the only way an object can cause effects on the world outside itself. 
In that case, the reference graph familiar from the programming language literature becomes identical to the access graph of the access control literature. It gives us a very natural way to express the principle of least authority, in which an object is only given that permission that it needs to do its legitimate job, such as giving the entry guard only the ability to increment the counter. And by giving objects very narrow authority, you deny them most of the opportunities for things to go wrong for them to be damaged if there's an exploitable bug. The fact that JavaScript can be used in this robust and secure manner is no accident. I joined the ECMAScript committee in 2007 when JavaScript was really a tremendously messy language. And we got all of these elements added to JavaScript, beginning with JavaScript script mode and object.freeze in ECMAScript 5. We got all of these things added in order to enable JavaScript to, to be used more reliably and more securely. JavaScript, the language, has no I.O. It's essentially a pure computational language where all I.O., all ability to cause effects in the world, is provided by the host. And JavaScript has several very different hosts. Of course, JavaScript started in the browser. By the way, have you guys heard of Conway's Law? How um, sort of technologies will, will mirror the organizations? No, I'm not aware. Mm. No. So there's, anyway, there's this law that says that the you know products will mirror the organizations that produce them and stuff. Um, the, the fact that JavaScript has no I.O. is partly my fault or my idea or whatever. The folks built, working on JavaScript came to the web consortium and, and asked if they should standardize JavaScript at W3C. And at the time, there were competing programming languages for use in web browsers. There was Tickle and Scheme and this and that and the other thing. And I didn't think that the web consortium should pick a winner. And so I kind of said, and, and we weren't really good at, at standardizing programming languages. And so I said, that's probably not a good idea. And so they went to ECMA. And so the JavaScript, the language itself is at ECMA and, and the uh, browser API was done by the web, the web consortium. Um, and you know, then you can use the same language in something like Node.js, which has got a different I, you know, I.O. system and stuff like that. So anyway, accident of history, if you will, but that's where we are. It's also now very, very prominent on single machine servers. It's also very prominent, but not well known to be prominent in embedded devices. Probably some of the devices in your house are actually running JavaScript. And of course, now we're running JavaScript on blockchain. And oh, by the way, JavaScript on embedded devices is, is what I'm doing for Agoric. Uh, well, not embedded devices, but there's a JavaScript virtual machine that's only 70,000 lines of code as opposed to Node.js, which is 2 million lines of code um, that they want to use for their blockchain. And so I'm porting their, their software to run on this. The, 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 the 70,000 lines of code is designed to run in embedded stuff. And I'm helping them adapt it to the blockchain stuff. What we're advancing is secure ECMAScript, is this secure runtime for enforcing the security properties needed to turn JavaScript into an object capability language. We have a core mechanism that works securely in JavaScript today. And we have a proposal before the committee that moves more direct support uh, directly into the standard. The SES secure ECMAScript kernel that we have working today was done in a collaboration between Agoric and Salesforce. And Salesforce is using this. Okay, this is a little bit. Some of the key elements of SES have already been incorporated into Node, Node over time. Okay. PC53, for specifically standardizing, the main embedded JavaScript is the XS engine Excellent. from Modable. And that one, they already have a configuration out of the box that's directly an SES engine. Oh, by the way. And we've been working with MetaMask. And uh, in the in embedded uh, JavaScript, uh, what do you have? Um, you're, you're talking about like the whole JavaScript with uh, parser and everything, right? Everything, that's right. It's pretty amazing. Where is yeah. my window that has my tabs and stuff? Uh, oh, it's this one. I've just gone full screen here. I see. Hold on. Um, so... Uh, Right, so this is my most recent. Um, Genode is an object capability operating system, and I got the XS um, JavaScript engine running on Genode. 
that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so the, and the thing, this XS engine just compiles to regular executables. So you can take, you know, all this met, all this thing where your, your Node.js application has got 7,000 files and you just make one A dot out, you know, just, or, or um, just like, you know, go or rust or whatever. So that's something I've been trying to do. Um, let me make that a separate window. So that when I go full screen, I can still find things. MetaMask also on the browser distribute the yeah, yeah, yeah. from built in, putting so much uh, as run under job oh, this is kind of cool. to secure Ethan script. These are the packages that make up a MetaMask bundle. As run under JavaScript today, each of these packages, if it misbehaves, can completely destroy the integrity of what it's running in. And when MetaMask is being used to manipulate financial assets on blockchains, then if MetaMask is corrupted by one of these packages, then it can not only destroy the integrity of your user interface, it can steal your assets. The assets are manipulated through the user interface. Now, I'd like to take a, um, like somebody in the audience to take a guess. Of the typical JavaScript application, how much of the code in the application is specific to the application, was written by the people putting the application together as opposed to just linking in third-party libraries. Anybody care to guess? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so the, so, so um, I'm actually very impressed at how accurate those answers were. Uh, NPM estimates that for the typical JavaScript application, the answer is 3%, which means 97% of the code that you link together to create an application is third-party code that you have little reason to be to have confidence in. And in JavaScript, as it's run today, every one of those packages is given all of your authority and can abuse anything that the application itself was given to manipulate. Yeah, this is scary. <laughs> and we've seen these attacks. Yeah. The attack called the Event Screen Incident was a malicious upgrade of a package published to NPM that was specifically targeted for... Dan, are you able to raise the volume on that or no? Uh. With SES and the way that they're specified, they can lower their risk to third-party code tremendously. So the colors here represent a measure of risk. The purple dot is the package that is the only one that is unique to MetaMask. All of these others are third-party packages that are linked in. But the green ones are those that, after static analysis about what it apparently uses, is then run under SES in such a way as to be given only the authority that it apparently uses. And therefore, even if it's malicious, its ability to do damage is very low. The red, of course, are the real hotspots, the things that are that need a deeper security review. So why are they red? Look, well, mouse over that one. And we see that that one's red because it directly accesses the network. It uses XML HTTP requests as a global variable. Therefore, in order to run this application, you have to run that module in an environment in which there is such a global variable that seems to be a global XML HTTP request object and any security. I hate the way he teaches this. This is not a, this is a, a violation of OCAP discipline. He shouldn't explain this until later or something anyway. Security review should start with these hotspots, should focus the attention on these hotspots first. No, you should rewrite them to get rid of them. We can also explode this into a graph of modules with the import graph among the modules where SES can constrain the import graph among the modules to only be within the package dependency graph among the packages. So how is it that we got from this tremendously messy language, JavaScript as it was in 2007, to the ability to use JavaScript securely in this way? Well, our approach has the slogan, don't add security, remove insecurity. So ECMAScript has some really terrible features that make secure programming impossible. So our first step was to define ECMAScript script mode, which we got into ECMAScript 5, and that leaves out most of those problematic features and enforces that you stay within the script subset. So we can take that off the table. ECMAScript script mode still has some severe problems that prevent it from being used as a secure language. In particular, any code linked into a program can reach in to object.prototype.push and replace the push method, sorry, array.prototype.push and re replace the array push method with some malicious push method that all the other code inside that system is now misled into using. Also, JavaScript as it's run today, there's a single shared global object that all code has access to, and that's where all of the host objects that lead to authority to the, to the outside world are. 
So these are the problematic features that we that we need to take off the table. We need to create a mechanism to enforce the absence of these features, and instead program in a JavaScript in which those these features are repaired. So that is secure ECMAScript. The good news is we had to take very little off the table in order to define secure ECMAScript. Secure ECMAScript is essentially JavaScript. The experience going back to the Kaha project at Google um, uh, from the, you know, early, the what, 2007 timeframe, uh, we found that a tremendous amount of old legacy code runs under SES. And today wow. with Salesforce, with MetaMask, with Agoric, we're finding that as well, that, that a tremendous amount of old code will run under SES. And therefore, we can use SES to bring these security properties. However, JavaScript is still a messy language. It's still a language that if you use the whole language, it contains many features that are hard to reason about. Double equals is infamous for having crazy um, uh, coercion rules. So what we've done for our own sanity is define a disciplined subset called Jesse that only has the parts of JavaScript that we know we can use reliably. And all the code you're going to see in this talk is in the Jesse subset, and most of the code we write at Agora is in the Jesse subset. And that brings us to the end of that layer. And uh, does anybody have any? In what, in what capabilities, uh, in what capacity is uh, Salesforce using it right now? So Salesforce uh, has what they call the Lightning platform. And the, the various applications. Yeah. I misremembered what he, what he taught in this. That did not have the scope that I was expecting. Um, Let me flip through some other slides. Um, well, it, that stuff wasn't totally uh, on the wrong planet. I'm going to have to tend to my dogs, too. Um, I can pause the recording. Yeah, pa pause the recording while I go tend to my dog for a minute. All right, so uh, I'm going to take this introducing capabilities to the next generation. There was a local college where a guy invited me to, um, to you know, substitute for him for one of his classes. Um, uh, web security patterns of cooperation without vulnerability. Um, that's the sort of, that's one of the name, the slogans for object capabilities is patterns of cooperation without vulnerability. Um, okay, so just how bad is it? Um, if you haven't watched the giant bags of mostly water securing talk, it's fantastic. Everything is broken. I already talked about that. Um, what weapons or tools do we have? You got Unix permissions. How do I give access to folder one to you without access, giving access to anyone else without root access so I can't create a new group? Can't be done as far as I know. Database grants, this is what I do at my day job. I grant insert on table one to Bob, and I grant select any table to Fred, and then screw it. I'm just going to grant DBA, which is like root access. Not only that, but if you could figure out like, you know, the, the sort of right permissions, the correct permissions to give people the right authorities and no more, how do you compose that with Unix file permissions? How do you say that everybody in this Unix file group can write to this table? Can't be done. Um, the Java class loader, loader was supposed to save the day. No, it, it has. It's also uh, not object capability based, so it has all these problems. The same origin policy in JavaScript has got the same problem. So, is there a better way? Um, arbitrary code execution isn't the problem. I claim the problem is ambient authority and separation of, of designation from authority. Um, so the ca object capability discipline supports the principle of least authority. Um, just reiterating this, if you have memory safety and encapsulation plus effects only by using held references and no powerful references by default. Uh, by the way, the Archain has access to the clock and the, and the um, registry and a few other things by default. So um, it makes me nervous a little bit. I think our type system is, allowed us, is going to allow us to say this code has no access to those. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, um, no powerful references by default. Then you get that the, the access graph is the reference graph and only connectivity begets connectivity. And you get this natural least authority. And you get to use object-oriented expressiveness for um, security patterns. And that's that same um, uh, paper, paper where the mints and stuff came from. 
Um, all right. So then switching to this. So he talked about how um, uh, Kaha was back in the 2018 era. Get this thing to show up at the right way. Okay. Um, early choice, late despair. Yeah, th these systems, OCAPs and, and access controls were sort of equally well known in the 60s. And then in the 70s, everybody took the ACO road. Um, so this is a very powerful program. You know, I guess I could skip a lot of this motivation stuff, but all, all that um, Solitaire needs to do is draw stuff on the screen, but it can steal all your files and encrypt them and all, you know. Um, I'm going to skip through all this. A uh, very powerful email message. Okay, road not taken. Um, vulnerability, security is an extreme modularity. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right. Um, we could take this one and run it through JS to row. To answer. Cool to respond to Jim's request. How do I select this text? Um, now I have not used JS to roll. Sorry? Uh, what is the test here? Uh, freeze. Roughly. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, ah. Um, All right, now I don't know whether um, JS Turo is quite smart enough to do this. How was I doing that before? I guess I was using IntelliJ, but uh, I'm not gonna, I don't know what it costs to get IntelliJ started. So I'm gonna try to stick, stay low tech a little bit here. Um, Drum roll. Sadness. Uh, okay, I can do it manually. I don't know what that was. I'm just gonna check real quick here. Oh. Okay. I don't know why that's failed. My project has rotten a little bit, but I will just do this by hand now. Um, then I have a quick question. You posted okay. a, link, a link in development channel. Is this related to uh, the topic or not? Which link? Uh, Channel-based security and self-sovereign identity. Oh, very much. I see. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, okay, so I actually... I'm going to rewrite this as a slightly different idiom because that's the one I, I taught to the, the, the converter. Um, it's also the way uh, Thomas Lobb writes his code. Did that hurt anybody? Or are you all still with me? Yeah, I'm fine with this. 
<laughs> Jim? Yeah, it's new but still, but I, 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 I'm aware of it. Okay. Um, and that's it, Yeah, yeah. They, they yeah. There's no arguments. And then uh, uh, it's defined as a uh, 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 what do you call it? A uh, piece of code. Yeah, it's a lambda expression or an anonymous function or whatever the heck. They're called arrow functions in, in the JavaScript community. I'm going to, I, var has very weird scoping stuff, so I'm going to change that to let. Um, and we changed def to freeze because he didn't get, get the word def through the community, the, the standards process. It came out as freeze. This is what happens when you submit your intellectual property to a, com to a committee. Um, okay. Uh, and otherwise... So, so bar. If you made it a bar count, would be global. No, not. Uh, it's not quite that bad, <laughs> but it's it's close to it. Um, all right. So, um, so. Da -da -da. I use Scala mode for, for highlighting JavaScript a lot of times. And defining a function with the function, it's, it's almost similar to var, right? You, you, get, you get hosting, uh, uh, hosting, uh, hoisting uh, in the same sense, right? Yeah, yeah, hoisting is the, the bad thing about var. I mean, the function will do the same, right? Uh, maybe. Um, yeah, there's all this weird stuff about temporal dead zone and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Um, Oh, wait. Okay, contract. Oh, actually, sorry. Uh, everything is, I've only done method suites. I actually haven't done bare uh, Lambda expressions. So I'm going to put another one of these up here. And I'm going to call this make. Um, Oops, what did I do there? Yeah, that's that. Okay. Or let's do this. Are you defining this uh, as a field, uh, this uh, make? Yes. Right? Or... Um, so, so this is, We wouldn't be scared by this, right? This is just regular JSON, or you know, if, if I do that, it's JSON, right? Yeah, and I'm looking at the, what what you are giving to freeze. Uh, this make uh, you want to have it like. Yeah, like just or... ignore everything down below here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just follow me here, right? This is a record with one field whose value is an integer, right? Yeah. Okay. This doesn't scare us, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Means the same thing. It's Ooh. called method syntax. Uh, maybe I have to do that. It's called method syntax. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Right. Ooh. It's pretty cool. All right, so uh, we're freezing an object with a make property whose value is a function. Um, and again, let's see if I, I could do this. 
use the same syntax. Um, all right. So the pattern is contract calendar. Make. New and then we make up something I often call it self in. Um, so self is going to be basically this thing. We didn't give it a name in, in JavaScript. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, we didn't give it a name in JavaScript. Um, but you kind of have to in Rolang currently. Um, and it's, it's that thing that has an inker method. Um, and I'm going to postpone the definition of that. So somebody tell me what you see so far. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, I didn't, one critical bug there. Does anybody see it? Uh, return? Yeah. And I think the more common style is this, which is a little weird to me, but whatever. Maybe a blank line. And the other thing is that you can put this up here if you want to. It's like JavaScript rolling. You have to be careful not to think that the order on the page means the order that things are executed, right? I prefer this style because um, we're going to have very, very long uh, contracts below. So if you have the return uh, on the on the like on the top, it's you know you, you see it Im immediately. I mean, this is my logic. Okay. Um, now managing mutable state, I have not taught the compiler how to do that. What I have done so far is I have change the way I do things in JavaScript to, to correspond to Rolang more. But I'm going to do something that's that's has the same functionality, but I have not taught the compiler to do it. Um, OK. And then I'm going to do count shift in. So Tomislaw, you're coming through very, very low. I don't know if it's a problem on my end, but. Uh, maybe my uh, uh, headphones. Yeah, I've, I've got my volume cranked up all the way as well to hear. Sounds okay to me. Okay, so did anybody follow what I did with count so far? Rao, do you see what I did? Not entirely, but I'm, I'm but I'm uh, getting through. Yeah. Let me do it again. So I'm going to allocate another channel, and I'm going to send zero to it. Mm -hmm. So the zero is going to hang out there for a while. Okay. And so that's uh, just initializing the count to zero. If you like, that's certainly the way it is in JavaScript. Um, to talk about initializing a channel is, well, that's a little loosey goosey. We're definitely sending to that channel though, right? Right. Okay. Um, and then here, if I want to increment it and return it, I definitely more verbose. I'm going to do match. Uh,
um, that does not make any sense to me at all. Okay, hold on. What's which the first character that doesn't make sense? Well, um, okay, so you're you're doing a match on count plus one, and then you're saying count, and then you're 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 binding that to the name count post. Yes. Then you're sending to the count channel count plus one, I guess. Okay. Uh, and then you're returning count plus one. And I guess your reason you're doing that is because there's no let yet in rolling. Correct. This is how I spell let. Right, so let generates a match so that you can give a name to an expression. Right. And then likewise. But I, I mean, why not just write count plus one? I mean, that would, you, only, you only need one line there instead of five lines or whatever, right? Because I'd have to do it twice, it's, and I, that makes me cringe as a programmer. Now, if I have a bug on this line, I have to remember to kit fix the bug in two places. Plus, I mean, I, I don't know if, if what the... Uh, I probably, it costs more flow. Although, yeah, there's a good question of whether a match or an, an, an ad costs more flow. I think in either case, it's going to do, do the plus twice. I don't expect so. Why would it do the plus twice in this case? I see. So, anybody want to nominate one of these to look at? Mint. I don't know. Check balance would be good too. <laughs> Either one. Check balance is in, a, in some ways better. Uh, Give me now, uh, well, or I'm still. Too quiet. Uh, well, it, it's quiet, but I can hear you. It's not your usual uh, volume. Yeah, I'm a bit on different uh, headphones. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we, we can certainly hear you. It's just just quiet. But if, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pick my uh, other headphones. Yeah. Did you have a question? No, he was just checking his, um, well, if we could hear him. Himself, please. Yeah, I, I, basically, I have a question uh, related to um, in JavaScript. You're you're basically counting that uh, this variable uh, for count counter uh, is not safe to to access it with multi thread, right? Multi threading, uh, but because in JavaScript you you have only one thread, so like you're calling the decrement decrement is safe, right? Yeah. Um. Uh, um. Uh, yes, yeah, so if, if this is definitely part of the, um, yeah, um, Miller, Mark Miller calls this turn-based programming or there's event-based or, but yeah, you definitely, it's single-threaded and if you want to do multiple threads, you do workers or the, what they call VATs or something like that. So their conclusion after watching people program for 30 years is that shared state concurrency is impossible for, you know, for humans. I mean, in, in rolling, we, we, we have that, right? We have um, like the final and uh, uh, like 
move the trigger? Not, um, you don't have it in the way that you have it in C++. You don't have this big von Neumann array of memory that somebody else can scribble into while you're scribbling, right? The, 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 the uh, like that. I, I see the, I see the only as the, as the language who gives you some kind of, uh, like, um, good way for, for managing this kind of global state, uh, tuple space. Right, yeah, the tuple space and the whole whole pi calculus semantics allow you to do really rich transactional semantics. Mm. I mean, there's there's stuff you can do like, you know, you can have um, uh, like, here's my um, hotel, you know, true, um, Suppose that some process is doing this, right? And then another process is doing your flight channel. And then I'm down here going for hotel from hotel channel, uh, flight from flight channel, have fun, right? Try to do that in any other blockchain programming language. Yeah, that works. Right. I mean, you could it actually um, th in JavaScript, it's promise at all, right? Right. But if you want to. You can do that with futures in Rust or something, maybe, I don't know, but um, and they, these are pretty simple cases. Um, but the join in Rolang is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, imagine trying to do that in Solidity. Yeah, and if you have like more than two, then <laughs> even more complicated, yeah. Not to mention that these don't have to be just integers, right? They can be sets of blah, 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 right? Or, or parallel things and all kinds of rich data structures. So yeah, um, but let's look at check balance row. So that's the one that got generated by the machine. So that's kind of interesting. And this is kind of the state of the art in my compiler. Um, because sometimes I convert idioms from JavaScript to Rolang, and sometimes I sort of wonder how to do them back the other way. But let's see here. Okay. Um, so JavaScript doesn't nat natively have tuples, so I'm making up the idea that there might be this library that allows you to talk about tuples. Um, actually, I think this this example runs, so I think I did make up. Uh, maybe not. Some of these examples actually run in JavaScript, some of them don't. Um, okay, and then I'm still playing around with this one, but we're gonna say that doing this syntax here corresponds to an import in JavaScript. Um, and then um, this E thing is, is basically just a mechanism for using promises, but it's kind of nice syntax that the Agoric fight folks have made up. All right. Um, and everything's asynchronous. So I, I made, I started in an asynchronous function. Um, all right. So, um, All right, so when my JavaScript to Roland compiler does this stuff, it sees this await expression. And in Roland, you have to have a name for this channel that you're gonna return things from the registry call for, right? Like, you know, there's a bunch of places in, in Roland where you have to name the channel and in, and in a lot of other programming, it's like when you have f of x, you don't have a name for the result of f, of, you just write f of x, but, it, but in, in Roland, you need some channel that you're going to use as the return channel. 
Um, and so it, it makes up the channel based on the, um, the AST node name and then uh, the line number and the column number. Yeah, so this is on line nine, column 36, and then there's a counter variable um, in case of collisions or something. So that channel means a channel that's relevant right there. Does that make sense? Somebody has to audibly nod. Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Um, and um, this is the eventual send thing. So this is, uh, we're going to basically do a, a function call that returns a promise, um, which is very much like what goes on when you do a send to this is how I, I, I spell send in, in JavaScript here. So we're gonna call that as a function and return a promise from it. And then um, it returns a, a tuple and I'm still wrestling with this, but to me a tuple is a product type and the, the natural product type in uh, JavaScript is the record. So a tuple is a record whose fields are underscore zero, underscore one, et cetera. Um, I think TypeScript uses uh, a list, which somebody else told me how I could do that, but I, it hasn't made it through my brain yet. But anyway, we're doing a destructuring assignment here, just like here. Um, so the, the, um, when you get something out of the registry that was signed, you get two, um, you get a pair of two things. One is the true or something. This is to distinguish the insert sign from the insert arbitrary or something. Anyway, so now we've got our hands on the RevVault Rev Vault contract. Um, the, the first part is uh, nonce. Uh, for the tuple. The first part is, is uh, what? Are, are, you, are you hearing me now or? <laughs> it's different, but go ahead. No, loud and clear. You're coming in, uh, yeah, very well. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, the first uh, uh, element in the tuple is the nonce. No, it's, the true. it's it's the constant true. Uh, for signed insert, it should be nonce, but uh, well, it's not. <laughs> okay, that's my experience anyway. Maybe I'm misremembering. Um. And then my compiler has specific support for console log. I just do this. I bind it to standard out. I, I usually use standard error these days. Anyway, so I, that's a, just a special case of the compiler. All right. And then uh, as we experienced er earlier, um, I use a match for let. So you put the right-hand side here and the left-hand side here. Um, and how did it know to put a star there? I don't remember how it knew to put a star there, but that's saying that Revadref is a name. No, because, yeah, it is a name, okay. I don't remember how, I, how it was smart enough to use it or why it chose to use a star there, but it did. Um, okay, so we match whatever that is oh. and we bind. So, 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 sorry for interruption, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking that when you create a variable, this must be a name always. So here you need a process, so you, you uh, add a star, right? That must have been my thinking. Um, but in Rolang, okay. you know, you can always trade a, a process for a name and back. So, you know, it was a totally arbitrary choice, right? But uh, when you create a variable, it, it must be a name. No, because I could just change all occurrences of rev address to that and, you know, whenever yeah, I but, uh, but uh, when you when you create the rev address, it must be a name. It's uh, the same as new, right? 
Oh, when you're doing new, I see. Yeah. Okay, but this isn't a new, this is a, you know, okay, that, but that does make sense, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm. Okay, um, and then I did a console log there, and then here's my little thing for doing tuple, and it turned into a tuple over here. Um, that's special to the compiler in a way. I'm still thinking about that. Um, again, it made up this new name, and we, we call, um, where'd it go? Right. Uh, rev vault finder create rev address and it made up the return channel for us um, and then it'll right and then it waits to get the, the value back over here and binds them and then wow did I do switch oh right I didn't do if um, it, a JavaScript programmer usually would have written if here but um, I, I only did match instead. Um, so switch OK case true, match OK if it's true, obtain the, the vault checking the balance. Um, we call vault.balance, vault balance. Uh, we get the result back and we say that the balance is blah, blah, blah. One of the things you'll notice is that as you go down in JavaScript, you go across the page in real life. Because in order to go do something sequential, you need a four, and JavaScript is naturally sequential going down. Um, and then the other thing to look at is how that compares to. It's going to be much better when uh, if you have a rolling one, one per one with a yeah. semicolon. It's yeah, like flat and stuff. It'll much be, more similar with the JavaScript. Yeah. Um, hey, you're going to have a debugger? <laughs> <laughs> um, where's the uh, source? Main resources. Oh, Although okay. I, I was thinking maybe if uh, we can use the uh, like debugger for, for JavaScript for, for rolling. If we can plug into the same protocol and then yeah uh, yeah everything yeah. Um, where is the check balance contract in the core vault demo? Um, So we can see how well the, the, the compiler did compared to this. Um, in this case, the rev vault channel. Oh, right. It's called rev vault channel down here. It's called await expression, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it calls this. It waits to get the result back. In this case, I made rev vault a process. No, a name. Yeah, this it's a process up here, so that's arbitrarily different. Uh, match rev adder against rev address. Here it's a process. Uh, stood out. Da, 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 da. And then where's the vault channel? Okay, so vault channel they they hoisted that up there to have fewer curly braces or something. Um, but I think you can convince yourself that these are equivalent. Um, I'm going to switch to the OCAP pattern list. unless there's questions about that kind of stuff. The, the, what I hope I've convinced you is that for basic idioms, there's a very close correspondence between JavaScript and um, Rolang. There's a lot of things where they're not similar, but. Can I, can I ask you about uh, promise and uh, um, 
you 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 ask also a question in, in Discord. Uh, you're you're relating promise to uh, persistent scent. Yeah, I was thinking that once a promise is resolved, it stays resolved, right? Mm. And so if you, if you just so happen to only read from it once, then you, you can just do what I did here and just, you know, equate promises and channels. But if you have two thens on the thing, if you have two different fours on something, then if you only write to it once, if you only send to it once, sorry, only one of those fours will fire, right? Yeah. Whereas in JavaScript, all of the thens fire on a resolved promise. So that's how do you mean all of the thens? Okay, let's do an example. Um, if I have uh, uh, Because in, in your translation, you're, you're using promise, but not semantically the same as channel, right? You're, you're on, the, on the syntax level, you can translate this uh, JavaScript to Rolling. But uh, from the execution point, they're, they're not really the same, right? Well, I got lucky in the case of, that I've got here. In, in, that, in that I'm only reading from the promises once, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I've got some promise there, and then if I, uh, will be executed right when, when it completes yeah yeah right so what i meant by that was that if i do pr.row and i do new p um, uh, and i do uh, for mm. um, p i see you mean if you are using the same promise in in two bindings right mm, yeah Uh, I, I found a uh, reference to ID language and um, they're, they're referring to I structures and M structures and I structure is the like like the promise and M structure is when you can change the value inside promise you know but just to, just to finish this yeah. example off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Yep. Jim, what do you expect to find in the log? Uh, or NetZipper, what do you expect to find in the log? So both, uh, both nests in, in uh, no, 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 in a rolling program, one of them. So one of them will consume uh, P. Right. You'll either see fun one or you'll see fun two, right? Yeah. Right. right. So if I want to make this Rolang act like the JavaScript, I can do a persistent send, right? Yeah. And then um, if I wanted to know, let's see, that's persistent send. Was that the whole thing? Oh, and I should also not actually consume it, although it doesn't. I said that this should be peak. Now I don't remember why. If it's a persistent sin, then it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Yeah, but if it's only a uh, usual send and peak, it will be the same only one of these four. I mean, if if you if you put peaks in both of them, then uh, with one send you will you will have both. Why did I think I had to do them in both places? I don't know. Um, 
but the other thing is that this can reject. But uh, the problem in JavaScript is not the promise. The, uh, the problem is that uh, this construction of promise is very similar to, to, to future, uh, which is not referentially transparent. So when you say P dot then, you are using basically the same reference. But uh, if this is like real referentially transparent variable P, then you will have two different promises. Say that again. So, so th yeah. this P, uh, uh, when you are creating the promise, this, this P, uh, whenever you use this P, th this will be the same reference to uh, to the to the promise. Yeah. And uh, uh, if if this uh, P is uh, referentially transparent, what what is now in 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 the, for example, in this FS2 library, uh, the, the streams are are oh. referentially transparent. And then you, uh, all, whenever you are referencing P, you, you get the new reference to, to, the, to the new uh, promise. Okay, well, I mean, this promise is clearly not referentially transparent. Promises have state, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if I wanna just finish the analogy, um, if I do reject, then neither one of these will print. If I do catch, Right, um, and so I want to finish that. Uh, you want the, that to be false, comma underscore. Yes. And I, I guess above that, you. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, this pattern language is really important. Um, so, there's a bunch of things you can do with object capabilities. The um, one of the simpler ones is is caretaker. Um, so this one of the ob objections of the access control list stuff is like, oh, wait a minute, once you give somebody the, the capability, you can't take it back. Okay, so if you want to be able to take it back, what you do is you wrap the base capability in a what's, what's called a revocable uh, forwarder. And then you hand out the forwarder. And then whenever anybody sends any message to the forwarder, you forward it on to the base capability until somebody calls revoke, at which point, at which point you, um, you, know, you break the seal. And so then anything sent to the forwarder anymore doesn't get to the base object. And so um, um, I can hand you a revocable forwarder to my car and then I, if I decide you don't get to drive my car anymore, I just call revoke. And then the capability you have is no good anymore, right? Um, and that is given in rolling in, um, I think here. Yeah. So this is the translation of revocable forwarder. Uh, so when you when you talk about uh, these uh, basic constructions, uh, can we can we see it as a uh, like basic building blocks for for uh, object capabilities? Absolutely. Like, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you also mentioned uh, 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 patterns. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. What, what, what do you, 
Oh, oh, this is uh, what you're referring to. This, pattern. Oh. this is a pattern. But the th nice thing about these patterns is you actually don't have to copy and paste them. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just put this on the chain somewhere and that's it forever. Um, well, actually, the, go ahead. Is this like an exhaustive list of patterns or, or it's not complete and there might be another? No, it's not exhaustive. I mean, you get to use all of programming, um, but this is just a well-known list of patterns. Um, I mean, in OCAPs, so if, is there a standard for OCAPs patterns? To some extent there is, and this is it. Mm. There's a book called E in a Walnut by, uh, da, 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 I'll let it go. Um, Anyway, this is it. Uh, how do I go up? Uh, Ian Walnut by Stigler. Um, I think the original is on his website or something. Or maybe his website's dead now. Um, anyway, so E was this programming language that, that Mark Miller and company put together in the early 90s. And they're basically turning JavaScript into E. Um, so any of the examples in this ebook, you have to change the, func the punctuation every once in a while. Like you change def to function and stuff like that. Um, but this is the, uh, the pattern catalog here. So facets, basically, if you've got like a, a read-write file object, you can make a facet of it that's read only. And when the, when anybody tries to call write on it, you just don't forward the, um, the message on. Um, revocable capabilities, we talked about. That one has a little piece of state inside of it. Um, sealer unsealers is pretty cool. Have you guys looked at this? Has, has anybody looked at sealers and unsealers? There yeah, it has been. been yeah. Okay. Look, it has been looked at. Some reason I keep getting confused about it. So it's basically like it's a, so almost like a multi sig. You have to have the sealer. Well, not really. Um, well, the multi sig is it's what they call write simplification, where you know we we used to tell you that you know um, um, you know unless you have the capability to do something you can't do it or whatever this is the kind of thing where you take two capabilities and smush them together and now you have a you have more than what you had before um you take the sealed box and the unsealer and now you've got the more than what you had before so they call that right simplification which is a sort of a you got to be careful about that um but the, you know the basic usage is you call the you know make give me one of these pairs um, sorry, here's where you get the sealer and the unsealer. You take whatever the heck it is you want to seal, you put it into the sealer and you, what comes out is this sealed box. That's like the encrypted, that's like the ciphertext, like the in, encrypted thing. You send it anyone you want to. And anybody who has the unsealer can call un, the unsealer on get the secret data box back. Okay, thanks for going through that again. I don't know why I get And this is one implementation of it. Um, the, in JavaScript, you'll see implementations that use weak maps more these days. That, that gives me a little, I wonder about the scalability of that sometimes. Anyway. And uh, also, uh, can the symbol be, be used, right? You're protecting some reference that only you can create, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then you, you store some object on this reference. And uh, only inside, uh, you, you can get the, to this reference. Right. right. Yeah, you totally have to have encaps encapsulation. You know, you can't do this in Python, right? Mm. I, I remember that uh, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was uh, listening to uh, uh, Crawford talking about, you know, this uh, with, uh, uh, cage or Kahak, I don't know how it's mm -hmm. and He was talking about, you know, how we need uh, this uh, uh, ability to, to, to have like private reference that no one can access. Right. Um, I'll have to clean this up later, but I think that's worth putting there. This is like extension of uh, of the counter, right? 
counter is very simple right. example, and then you have this unsealer as a like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of these patterns just go, I mean, the, this whole, um, catalog just sort of builds up slowly. It's like the first one, seven lines, the next one's nine lines, the next one, 15 lines. It's not too scary. Um, okay, so now we have uh, this notary inspector thing. Um, this I want to use for art on the blockchain um, for making it so that you can authenticate art on the blockchain. So you, the, the notary inspector, after you run this code, you get a notary um, which is something you have to you have to hold closely, right? Because the notary can stamp things, and then the inspector you give out to the whole world, and then anybody who has the inspector can verify that something was notarized by that notary. Um, poof. Go ahead. I'm just thinking that this again sounds like sealer unsealer, but more complicated, right? Like right. a, a, another step, right? Yep, another step. So this one's, you know, a few more lines of code. In all these cases, if you're going to use Rolang 1.0, that you can multiply by three by the, the lines of code and stuff like that. Maybe Rolang 1.1, you won't, won't be so bad. Um, proof of purchase is the simplest of a series of capability patterns in which the goal is not to transfer an authority, but rather to show someone that you have the authority so they can comfortably proceed to use authority on your behalf. I haven't looked at this one lately. Um, claim check. Um, you park your car and you get back a little ticket and then you come back and you turn in the ticket and get your car back and nobody else can take your car because you're the only one with the claim check. Um, Non-transferable claim check. I haven't looked at that one. A little bit more code. Loan officer protocol. I haven't looked at this one. So let us consider a different problem. Suppose that the different attendants are trusted to handle different cars by the by the valet service. One valet <clears throat> has a motorcycle license and parks all the Harleys. Another has a multi-engine pilot's license and parks all the Boeing 747s. Of course, the one with the motorcycle license is a teenager who always wanted to try his hand at parking a 747. He knows his lack of experience is not a problem. In this situation, each, each attendant has a different set of authorities at his command. Just because you hand your claim check to a legit attendant doesn't mean the valet service thinks it would be a good idea for let, to let that attendant drive your vehicle. Um, this is this area is voluntary oblivious compliance or VOC. Okay, well anyway, these are really interesting to read. Um, oblivious claim check says guards. You can you can make so, a little bit of a type system out of these, a, a sort of dynamic type system. Power box is when you sort of at, ask the user for things. The power box that everybody's familiar with is the file manager. But imagine that if the file manager, in turn, instead of returning a string, returned an actual file access object, then you know then you'd have an actual secure system. Yeah, that's another theme in object capabilities is anything that allows you to like take a string and turn it into an IO object. Eh, that's not object capability. That's like taking an integer and turning it into a pointer. We can do that in C++ because it's, you know, it's unsafe or C or C++, but you can't do that in Java, right? Or Scala or Rolang or anything. You can never take an, even though you know the 64 bits that make up that unforgeable name. You can't feed the, feed the 64 bits as an integer to a piece of Rolang and have it turn it into a, an unforgeable name, right? Cannot be done. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can do it on your machine, but you cannot convince uh, other validators to do this. Right. <laughs> um, membranes are cool. You can have a whole graph of objects that all have pointers and stuff like that. And any time you want to talk to any of them, you send a message through the membrane to all the stuff going on inside there. And anytime they want to talk out, they, they pass things back through the membrane. And then you have, just like you could revoke the capability to access that one object, you can revoke the whole membrane and everything inside there goes poof. I don't know how you do that in, in Rolang. That one sounds tricky. Um, there's a lot of these that, that involve 
these um, you know mutable variables and and the fact that um, JavaScript is sequential, where to express that in Rolang, you'd have to say, okay, now don't do anything while else while we're doing this. <laughs> right. I mean, when you when you take something from the channel, you're basically doing that that thing. You're saying, yeah. oh, now now I have the value. No one else can get the value. Something like okay. that. Yeah, yeah. I just haven't figured it out in general. Um, pet names and forgery, really, really cool. Um, is anybody here familiar with Zuku's triangle? No. no. It's actually also in anybody met Zuku? Anyway, pretty cool guy. Um, so there's three desirable properties of names: human meaningful, decentralized, meaning anybody can make up make one up without talking to anybody else, and secure. And for a long time it was thought that this was one of these, you know, here's three pick two engineering trade-offs. Um, and to some extent, Bitcoin dealt with this, but um, anyway. Um, are, are you saying this is not the case? Or that you need to pick two or? Um, it's sort of like if everybody has a copy of this database of everything, then you can have all three properties or something like that. Mm. Um, and everybody has to agree on the database and look what look what look what Bitcoin did. Right? They made it so everybody can agree on this whole big database. Um, so to but, say centralized, I should be able to choose the name Jim, right? But I think a lot of people are gonna do that. Right. Well the the way this pet name stuff works is I come to you and I say, here's my 128 bit name. Please call me Dan. And then you go, okay, Dan's as good a name as any, as any, you know, you said you want me to call you Dan, I'll call you Dan. Um, and so you put Dan in your, your address book next to, um, to the, that 128 bit number or whatever. Um, and then, uh, from then on, you just sort of exchange the 128-bit numbers. And uh, if anybody else comes along with that 128-bit number and says, I'm Fred, you know, please send me the $100. You're like, wait a minute. I already saw that 128-bit number. That's Dan. You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to spoof me. Um, it's things like that. Um, so basically, the, one of the better presentations that I saw this early on was we screw all this certificate stuff. All you need to do, you know, the certificate authority stuff, all you need to do is have websites with their public keys. And the first time I go to my bank, I, they say, you know, I'm bank one. And I go, yeah, sure, you're bank one. And then anybody else who claims to be bank one, you know, my browser will just not light up at the top because you don't have the same key. Um, so it was, it was a pretty cool presentation. Um, it does mean that it's kind of like when you do SSH, the sort of trust on first use, you SSH to some machine and it goes, ah, scary, 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 new machine, this is scary, scary. And you go, no, not that scared. I know this machine, you know, and this, I know that this is the first time I'm using this machine. And then you use it for lots and lots of times. And then somebody on the other end, like reinstalls the operating system and the host key changes. And then your machine goes, ah, scary, 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 scary. Right. Trust on first use is the yeah. same pattern. And uh, I, I see problem in this situation because uh, you you published this your, your bank published your this public key, and then uh, they for example need to change this key or or you know it, it is compromised. How to change it to, to to say to all the users, oh now we have the new one. Yeah, yeah. That's why you want rich, you know, um, protocols for updating them. You know that use. Yeah. Um, okay, so where the, I was looking at, anyway, so this is how to do a pet name system 
uh, just without any cryptography, basically, just using um, unforgeable names or, or you know, object references in JavaScript. Um, they don't have the code here. Anyway, that's what I'm hoping we're doing in the in the um, uh, liquid democracy directory. I think we're building that up, but I got I'm, I'm still working on checking that. Um, so I wanted to make sure everybody definitely knows that there is this um, catalog of of patterns. And I would like it if that whole catalog were here and we had all of them with modern JavaScript and Rolang with test cases and everything. Yeah. I, I wonder if we can make them problem statements for the hackathon. Each of the pattern could be a problem statement or maybe a couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. the really cool thing would be if somebody comes and says, I want to build a lemonade stand on the blockchain. And you go, oh, okay, you need the, the, the mint, um, mint purse pattern. Let's go make sure it's documented well, right? Ooh. Or somebody says, I want to do a car loan program on the blockchain. You go, oh, great, let's use the loan officer protocol. Let's make sure it's documented well, right? Yeah. But, I mean, this is one of the things we need to come up with is a bunch of uh, problem statements that we can hand off depending on the uh, number of teams or whatever. And also to the extent- okay, well, well, if you get to repeat that assertion, I get to repeat the, the, the counterpoint, which is no. If you're not <laughs> interested, have their own problem statement. Statement. Oh yeah, yeah, we have that. <laughs> no, I agree, we have that. We are, we, in the registration form, we say, you know, give, um, give a description of the problem you want to solve. Excellent. Um, so we have that, but I mean, then there may be people that really didn't give because we made that optional and we, so they may come in without anyone, or even if, like you said, just now, uh, they want to solve something with car loans, we may be able to, um, essentially say, okay, that these are the patterns that were applicable to that. And to the extent that the pattern is already documented, it reduces us a little bit of a support burden on our side because they can read through the stuff, they can look at other examples. Yeah, my expectations is not that we're not gonna have a lot of pretty documentation finished by October 11th. My expectation is that the people that succeed in this block, in this hackathon are gonna deal with crappy documentation and they're gonna come out of it wanting to help us fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying if the pattern is documented, like on this e-write right. uh, site, at least we can, it, it's something for us to show them and say, you know, here is, here is the stuff, look at it and learn about it and then implement it. Yeah, I uh, kept thinking I would spend a little more time on this site, but I haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have another question related to this e rights patterns um, or in, in and uh, Walnut patterns. So they have this thing called Async uh, Scholar. Did you look at that to see if that's, um, the, the Async Scholar project seems to implement the e rights patterns, but they say the code is alpha quality. Did you uh, play with that or take a look at it? They have turned off all the ambient authority? Uh, not, I don't think those are the links. Let me see if I can paste the link. I mean, here. there's a hundred libraries for doing Async stuff in Scala. Uh, well, this particular one is referred to uh, on the eRights website. So let me paste the link here in the chat. I put that in the chat over there. What channel? In the Zoom chat. Yeah, I prefer that folks don't use that because it goes poof at the end of the call. Yeah, I agree. Um, should I should put that uh, in the development channel? Or, or I guess you're in education. I'll put that over there. So these guys are saying that they uh, they follow the e language. Um, Have you pasted it? How do I get this? Okay, chat. Oh, 
All right, event loop concurrency. Oh, e programming language. 2011. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the concurrency stuff is not anywhere near the hard problem part in as far as Scala is concerned. Like I said, there's a hundred ways to do concurrency in Scala or, you know, actors and all, all the related stuff. But nobody has, well, efforts to tame the standard library so it doesn't have any ambient authority. The, the, um, there was a Joe E thing that did a long time ago, but I don't think anybody's done it for Scala. Uh, let's see, let me use, uh, if I go back to, oops, all right, the wiki, and I go, what about my language, Joe E? Um, was how to do OCAP programming in Java way back. Uh, but it, it's, remember when I said that the problem is not arbitrary execution, it's ambient authority. If any part of your program can just open up a network socket and send all your data to the, you know, to your enemies, then who cares what your async framework is? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in there is an example they're using print line, you know. Right. I'm not sure if this is. <laughs> well, a lot of times there's a there's an exception made for like trace, and the and the the what the rules are that you can't actually count on it to do anything. So if trace turns out to be a no op, your program still has to be correct. Yeah, it makes sense. Like standard output in rolling right now. Yeah, well, standard output is, is an actual capability that you should pass around in most cases because that's a feature of your program. If, if standard out did nothing, then your program, you, you know, you'd be disappointed. Right. Um, yeah, I don't see anything in here about security, frankly. <laughs> oh, and um, the other thing, if you want to get completely bathed in this stuff, um, okay, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the um, this is the ten-page version of OCAPS. So if one hasn't read that, do it, do it. Okay, it's actually thirty in the PDF or something like that, but it feels like ten pages to me. Um, and then if one wants the two hundred-page version. Um, It's Mark Miller's PhD thesis. Um, and the good news is that you know one third to two thirds of it already. They're you know explaining object oriented programming and the history of it and all this kind of stuff. When you're doing academic work, you have to cite all the precedents and all this kind of stuff. But it, it talks all about you know why event loop concurrency and all this, there's like a really subtle E order thing where you're doing uh, messages over the network and you can't count on FIFO because you can't do that between mutually distrusting parties and um, all kinds of stuff. But it's 200-ish pages. So I was a little late coming into uh, the session. Did you already answer the why JavaScript, why not TypeScript for uh, Agoric? I did not. Um, now, searching Twitter is tricky. Uh, Twitter has the attention span of a gnat. But we won in this case. It's a shame you aren't using TypeScript. Do you have an opinion blah, 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 blah. Uh, TypeScript is technically unsound. You can't rely on the types to draw security conclusions. Um, Programmers have to understand the untyped code. We, they actually do use it. Um, there's this idiom or way of using it um, where you write this TS check at the top and you write .js files and the type strip checker does all the nice things like this. And if I misspell this, I get, you know, it, it yells at me and so they are using TypeScript. Just not relying on it. Oh, that's interesting. 
I love it. And, and this is something that you could do on anything that you do, right? Without, yeah. uh, well, I guess you need their library and then you're good to go. No, it's, this is a TypeScript feature. Um, um, uh, it's parsing the JavaScript and then uh, generating ty TypeScript, basically. Yeah, type checking JavaScript files. This is, you know, from Microsoft. This is a technique they now promote. Um, so this is the way I write JavaScript these days. Oh, and, and Jim, it wouldn't work the other day because I had TypeScript turned off because I, would, I used to use Flow all the time and Flow and TypeScript sort of yell at each other for different reasons. Um, so now I'm converting all my Flow. Flow used to support types in comments and now that TypeScript supports types in comments I've and everybody else uses TypeScript, I've switched over even though the TypeScript type system is unsound and you have to look at it, but anyway. There's a, there's a sound type checker called Helm, Helm or something, what's it called? Helm. Helm. Or something, right? Oh, crud. What was? Um. Darn. Um. I had it in one of these. Contributing files. Well, okay, there is one, but I haven't I haven't figured out how to use it. It does it has more inference um, and it's sound. Um, of course, it'll reject more programs. I mean, it's consistent with st strong types, but being embedded in JS. Did I? Anything important I missed in here? Oh. Corkboard demo. That's when SES was new. Uh, this is a little example of. Uh, connectivity, oh, the anchor thing. And then, yeah, they, they, they've got better example, motivating examples than Bob and Carol. The, the, uh, the, the incoming guard and the outcoming going guard were better examples now. Uh, oh, they're working on this in, infix syntax, which is turned into till dot because something else uses. Uh, right. So when I wrote E in that thing the other way, I wrote E parentheses Bob P dot foo Carol. And th so they're trying to get a, a, a um, syntax for this, that standardized. And when you, if you string several of them together, you can do promise pipelining. Learning, so you only do one round trip for the whole thing. Um, yeah. So, guys, I have to drop off. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dan, very much. Very great, great walkthrough. All right. Cool. Uh, did you think about uh, Hegel for? Uh, That's the one. Yeah. I remember you, you already posted this. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. Yeah, I haven't managed to get the tooling set up to try it. Me too. So this you're saying is better than TS check? It's actually sound, right? Mm -hmm. 
and it does more inference. Okay. There was a few months ago, I sort of got going on OCaml. Man, if you've ever gotten the OCaml dev tools going and stuff, that is so sweet. Have you ever done OCaml development, um, Thomas Law? No, no. I was just, you know, trying a few times, but yeah. I guess it's like Scala if you have a machine that's big enough to handle Scala dev tools. <laughs> <laughs> But OCaml comes out of like the late eighties. And so when, you know, the, the, if you've tried on a, comp on a computer these days, it's just so fast. It's really great. Uh, is there a concurrent version of uh, OCaml? <laughs> almost, they're working on it. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> I mean, I, I hear that like uh, in uh, 2017 uh, about <laughs> Kind of yeah, yeah, it's going to be a long time and nobody's going to care by the time it's done. So, um, I want to sort of end this and then start a session with you, Jim, if you're available on the liquid democracy stuff and our chain status and stuff. Sounds good. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. I appreciate that. I, that was helpful. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Always interesting. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Welcome. All right, I'll see you guys. See you. Jim, so you we're good for Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., right? For the hackathon thing, I'll send out a meeting in my... Yeah, it's in my calendar, but yeah. Okay. But it'll be good. Thanks. Jim, are see you going to talk more or are you exhausted? Sorry, are you asking me or anyone? Yeah, I was just wanted to say that I will jump off. Okay. Yeah, yeah I um, my wife is asking me to go somewhere, so I'll leave. Sure. But I'll see you guys later. Thanks. See you. Bye bye. Ciao. Jim, I seem to have lost your attention. Oh, maybe you're back. Yeah, I guess I was on mute. Because... Oh, so yeah, you might have mentioned up. that part three, I think would be worthwhile to, to, uh, for people to follow. Uh, yeah, that's the part where that technology that you're looking at there is where we could talk about how we can actually connect Agoric's technology to our chain. Right. And, oh, it's also relevant to when you're just deploying code from, you know, just your, this make file scenario. Yeah, and, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, even, be, even, even between clients, it's just, yeah. now it's a look at, I mean, the client is basically a bat, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. All right. Um, yeah. I, so, I need a bio break, and then you had a JQ question that I can answer now, or try to in a minute. Am I still recording? Uh, if you can split the recording now. Okay.